how do you say it? I want to turn ten. So I can, you know. I mean, I don't know. I'm I not. I don't know that. I'm not an expert in tennis, so that's and I don't know what there is. I mean, you can't make that call or call. No, but I definitely think. I mean, I don't know how many of them are confident or not, but elementary is very different than high schoolers. Middle school. Those are kids that are like, what are we talking about? Under 10? 10? Oh, I, I do see it very different. And I would, I would imagine, although I don't, I'm not a trained mental health professional, but I would imagine that our mental health professionals in the elementary are trained differently. And they would handle it differently than if the student were the high school student. So we, we need to make sure our job is to make sure that our mental health professionals are trained where we want it, and that our elementary mental health professionals are trained elementary students. So if we have that situation, they know how to handle it. And they, I'm sure, would handle it differently than, but I, but I don't, and I don't make that decision. I mean, I think parents have certain rights. <coughs> they do for their children, they absolutely especially do. elementary school children. So oh, I understand what you're saying, certainly. but I stand firm that I do think that parents need to be involved. And whatever the board decides, the school board decides, collectively as a whole, because I'm only one person, but. So what, what's being proposed is that we get feedback from state lawmakers, federal lawmakers, and our advising attorneys, so that whatever we do determine are the steps and policy, because yeah, we, we make policy based on that input from other sources. Qualified to do that, you know, and, um, but that's not clear yet. So in the interim, you do the very best you can to. So are you waiting for Title IX to fill these changes to see how if they're going to change, or what? I guess what is the? Because as of today, it's different than if those changes go through. Yeah, and, and again, that's the reason that I'm, I would argue strongly against any policy being put in place because. Those things are going to change so often. We would be coming to the board with virtually annual changes to, to this policy. Well, if that's necessary, then that's what we have to do. Yeah. It just yeah. couldn't get waited. Yeah. Harking back to, I don't want teachers to feel the pressure that they have to make the decision of the referral. That's totally wrong. That's not their license to do. Can you do it or can you? No, I agree. Did you ever have to do that? Never. And I, if I had a situation like that, my first step would be to tell the students, let's, let's have a conversation with you then and hand off to somebody who is trained in it. I don't think that that's just the protocol. But of course, that's the teacher isn't making that decision because mm -hmm. the teacher has a protocol and it's the policy is a lot for Tim Hammond. They indicated that. Make a choice. Didn't it? Didn't it? Correct. But the, and that's why I'm saying. How I did that. <laughs> what I'm saying is we need to make sure that the teachers are helping that student have the conversation with the counselor. That would be the no. way I would approach it. 100%. Other than if you've suspended abuse, then your your obligation is to call child protective services directly. You're a mandated reporter, and there's no other way around it. You have to make a call, even if you believe others may have. But let's say you had a student that you saw seemed very sad, or you know, if there was a change in their behavior that you had concern about, counselor would be my first go-to at least. Because they're also so able to talk with the other teachers the and that child. Students, parents receiving that. That's well, two, different two, two different things. We're talking about the, the survey as okay. a whole. That's at the pronoun. The pronoun policy. Survey. Yes, yeah, so the that pronoun that? survey piece of the puzzle. That, that needs to be 
shared ahead of time with Tom. Uh, the the, the follow-up piece is more of the transgender issue, where a student would be coming to the teacher to, to say, you know, I didn't ask you as the teacher, I didn't ask you to that, you know, what, what pronouns you want to be called. Or you came to me, and so I want to be called she, her. Okay, what do I do with that information now as a teacher? That's that's the conversation. And and what we're saying at that point is we need to make sure we're we're working with the professionals that we have in our buildings to address those issues. That's why I need to work with you to have that conversation with our with our council staff. But as a teacher though, it's still gonna be put in a situation like during conferences. Who's gonna advise them what to do with it? I think, that, I think that becomes part of the discussion and more so the back of getting us to the work of the counselors to communicate that to the parent, right? I mean, because yeah. if a student yeah. is comfortable enough to tell an educator that they want to go by nickname or pronoun, the goal would be, based on my, guess, my notes here, correct me if I'm wrong, but I have it wrong, is to get the students with the help of the counselor to communicate with the parent. Mm -hmm. Because that would be part of that discussion, right? You ask me to call you she, her, and if I communicate with your parent, ultimately I, have, I could slip. Not because I'm intentionally trying to do anything other than the fact that we have a conversation about your education. This is why it's important that we have your parents involved in that discussion, right? I mean, is, could that be part of that discussion? Because, I mean, that, that's a reality. Yeah. Because I'm going to have to communicate with your parents about a multitude of things right. regarding school, right. what we're here for, right? right? Like, so it could be. And I've seen that happen with just regular names, right? Like, right. Yeah. you go by his name is Anthony, and you want me to call him AJ, and he wants me to call him Smoke. And the next thing I know is you're at a conference, and I call him, and you're like, who? Yeah. Oh, no, he has me call him Smoke, right? Like, sure. it's, again, I'm not saying gender identity and names are the same, but, I mean, that's just the situation where things in the schools can happen, and it's nobody's fault because, particularly, I lived in high school. I mean, that's, that's where I spent all my career. Things are sure. different in a high school than they are at an elementary level. Right. Right. And again, at that, that middle school level is the challenging part for us as it is because you know, where is that 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 age of maturity that we need to consider? I mean, yeah. So would this be an administrative guideline then? Is that what you were thinking? Um, like this process would be an administrative guideline or it would it would fall under what is our practice as a, as a school district, which is basically what an administrative guideline does. Now, would we physically do that? I I don't know if we put it in writing anywhere because we got individual situations that are different from one person to the next. 
your guideline could be, but you know. I like the goal of the district. Yeah, towards. the goal of the district is to have, you know, to have a, you know, kind of like that policy the language is up there that all, you know, there would be, you know, be a class that whatever the line is above the parents below, so that the relation between the parents and the school is symbiotic, right? Like that is our intent and part of educating the kid is to get them to get over their I mean, that's an inherent thing. I mean, a kid gets in trouble, well, they don't want other parents. Mm -hmm. So help them communicate. And it's, it's, it's part of that education process mm -hmm. to get them to do that. And then if there is an issue with the family, it's also our obligation to make sure that that parent's held responsible for that and the right authorities are called. That's right. right? Like if a student is going to get abused or neglected or kicked out, like, and they're under the age of 18, like, we have a right, right. to, like, say, okay. hey, like, Job family services, this is going on, and then to have continual support for that student after report to check in with her or him to say, How is it going? What things can we do? And trying to like foster that because and that's that's general to anything, though. You know, I mean, I, I think that should be that's, what that's always been our standard. I mean, again, I worked here before, right? Like, I was here for five years as a high school principal, I ran the school, so successful enough to be called back, right? Like, at least, you know, at least, you know, and it's that's your that's, problem. Yeah, <laughs> but that's always been what we've done. Like, we can't forget that. Like, this isn't new. No, but I like what you said, and I think if you had at least some kind of administrative guideline that would speak to that, I mean, parents would at least feel a little bit more confident in knowing that that is the ultimate goal, is so that and I think that's together. been in practice for some time. It may not have been verbalized in that way or reflected in Mr. Hammond's letter, but I know you know, just in general, our counseling staff, they always recognize that a child, minor child, benefits from the loving support of his or her family. And sometimes, just like, you know, I don't want my parent to know I had a F on my math test. They, kids in general, want to please their parents, rise to the expectations that their moms and dads or guardians have for them. So the guidance counselor's role is to help them understand they love you, they want to help you. If you're having trouble broaching this conversation, let's do that together. How can I help you do that? That I know is, is part of their regular practice. And if a parent isn't being supported because they don't want to anything to happen, right? Like they, kids, you know, and maybe they don't, but it, it, again, it's that getting them connected them with the right resources to help the parent understand to accept their child for whoever he or she is, right? Like, again, it's making the connection with trust first because that's what they do. Again, and then checking out the kids, how is it at home? How is it going? You know, it's not, it's, again, it's, Crossroads it's, is it's a, crop, it's, a it's a constant dialogue because we can't, in any situation, we learned this with obviously not again bullying and harassment, right? The way that we handle it now and the way we handled it 20 years ago are drastically different, right? We know we have to follow up with the victim, we have to follow up with the aggressor, we have to continue to check in because just because I discipline Jenny for you know harassing Craig doesn't mean that that solved the issue, right? I gotta go back and check on Craig repeatedly to, to make sure that there's not an issue there. So I mean the, the same the same thing holds true in a scenario where a parent may not be accepted, right? Because we know that that could happen. But we shouldn't let that fear dictate how we we do things, right? We should we should then take steps that we need to kind of control that. And I think that's what, that's what I heard Greg said. I mean, when you talk, that's what I heard. But again, what my understanding is a lot different than the general public because I've lived this for 20 right. years, right? Like I, I've seen it. So. So could you then do administrative guidelines that kind of speaks to what you guys just talked about? Uh, I've got this. And then, and then that could be also sent out to the sixth grade and up teachers. Yeah, it, because we'll obviously need more conversation, starting with our principals, then going to our counselors, involving crossroads as well, so that everybody's aware of, of what what we are striving to do with, with this process. Um, thank you, Matt. Yeah, you know, so there's some, there's some steps we're going to be taking. I think Tony Hammond just said a case where a student was in trouble because they feared that a parent would be accepting. A 
a lot of times, that we were just kids, all of us may have um, anticipated expectations and were anxious about an outcome that may or may not happen. But we, we recognize that by opening that dialogue with the student first and talking about how that can be put together so that there is a, a support in place and then it can be, be figured out. And then that's a big stress reliever for everyone. You know, sometimes a parent doesn't know, and sometimes they do, but they don't maybe want to consider it or, or tip the balance in a particular way by opening a conversation. So I think our wonderful counselors and our Crossroads partners can facilitate good outcomes. I'm sure <coughs> the children want it. Again, having somebody have those conversations, and I know for sure that is a goal. And, and I think this is where we would be looking at the, what what other outside experts. Once we get to that point, can we bring in to help support that student and that family as we're going through this process? Mm -hmm. and, and I know there are great resources in the county that we can tap into that that will help us navigate some of that. I understand. I just feel different about parents worrying about that side. I, I just feel like who knows the child better than the parents, you know, in the majority of situations. I do understand there are the, the certain situations um, that would be that you can do that. Right. So I get that. Um, but I guess my I just view it a little different. I just, I just feel but it's interesting because dealing with juvenile minds. There's no other mind like it. Once you become an adult, you move away from that. Children are up and down, change their minds, impressed. They're followers, they're leaders, they follow up their friends, they look up to someone who is now, today, their electronic media, and all of this drives them to change their mind, change who they are, do something different. Feel left out, feel in, feeling out, changing. Parents, I can't speak for all parents, but sometimes parents don't have a clue what their kids are doing. And I'm not gonna say that's the majority, but the minority of the kids need parents. And so what we wanna do is be everything to those children and not involve the parents right away. Because someone might how many children speak to their parents like they speak to their friends? Do all parents talk to their children like adults? Do they all engage in conversation with their parents? Do they get on TikTok and whatever media there is and they see and they're, they're led astray by something that happens? They change their minds today. They don't dress the same as everybody else. So we have to engage and protect the okay, you don't want the child to get hurt by it. At what point do you say parents need to know? Parents have a right to know their kids are let's say acting differently. And when you protect the child and don't let the parents know, how do the parents make take corrective action? seem to want to leave them out until it's really an issue. We've said it's an issue now, but parents need to know regardless if they do or they don't know. Well, maybe they know. Maybe they'll say, well, that's fine. 
Jimmy's going to be called Jamie. No problem. That's all done. But the more stress we put on your children, that will push them too, to being suicidal or harming themselves or introverted. We participate in that process. We have to set, not accelerate, but we have to move them along. The parents, whether it's one parent, two parents, or four parents, maybe they're remarried. Somebody else needs to know. Do we have enough counselors to deal with all these issues? Do we have one in every building? That's why we so are these have any counselors. This is a, a pretty dramatic and fairly rare situation, but all the other things, kids who are depressed or feeling very anxious, where it's really interfering with their success, those services have been invaluable because we can make them available very quickly, where, you know, on the outside, it's, it's very costly. Well, there's other issues that we face. The children aren't just transgender. No, I Who they hang out with, who they are, you know, the pronoun issue. There's so many issues. Yeah, I mean, bullying or parents should be aware of as much as possible of these children. Children don't even tell their parents I'm getting bullied in school. I know that for sure. I think all of us have had kids fall highly. Very humbly find out that they've actually been bullied at school. <laughs> they said, oh, yeah. oh God. <gasps> oh, <laughs> who? Who was involved in it? Yeah, so, you know, we obviously big things you hope you would recognize just in their demeanor. And, but, you know, sometimes they, they live kind of a, a separate other life on the outside than they are at home. And there's some kids that are horrible, horrible, and wonderful on the outside, and vice versa. I have a little piece of that night, too. <laughs> so I just, I think by having a good team of well-trained mental health professionals, counselors, as partners in helping all kids find their, their happiest future, that's always our goal, whether it's academics or other social issues, well, then when kids are regulated, they're better right. Yes. Really are open. Absolutely. You know, when, when, you're, when you're struggling with it, you're probably it's really hard to help with someone else. Well, and I, I think, you know, our current policy that we're going to have, we have parental involvement in education. It does speak to parenting, you know, and when parenting skills are promoted and supported, um, we're going to have parents be full partners in the decisions that affect children. We're all going to agree on it, and that's okay. Um, but at the very least, I would like when we do send out the email, I would like for us to know prior to everybody else getting it, so that we have a heads up. Um, and then, if there, you know, administrative guidelines, I, I think we should all know about that as well before they're. So I'll work through that communication plan then. Um, just some of the guidance. Some of that may change based on who we talk to as well from a counseling standpoint, from a cross purpose standpoint. I want to make sure that we're, we're very clear on that what we want to make sure that we're working towards that goal there. Sooner rather than later. Okay. Thank you. 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 Communication plan around the preferred pronoun trans transgender conversations. Uh, public participation policy first reading on November first, and then uh, calling Mary and Monty about the eight new letters to the transgender line two oh seven from the OSB handbook mm -hmm. uh, and how much that helps. We're awesome. So those are the 
those are like three major things mm -hmm. to do just right now. Is there anything else that comes to mind? Well, when you say you're the diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff for the next week's meeting, are we doing it tonight? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.